Tonight on NJTV News, track repairs threaten commuters on three rail lines. Will NJ transit riders share the pain equally or get the short end of the deal? A mild town hall with a major flashpoint. Voters aim their barbs not at the congressman, but at the president. Water wars over the Delaware River. New York controls the flow New Jersey needs. Are we getting shorted? A fast way to trace a weapon used in a crime. New protocols cut the wait time for ballistics from months to hours. And Newark schools are climbing out from under decades of state control by increasing student help and reducing political heat. Those stories and more next on NJTV News. Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Live from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio at Two Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. Amtrak summer-long track repairs threatened what's being billed as a summer of hell for commuters. Lawmakers called in transit heads to get details, but if they were hoping to hear there's a way to avoid it, they had to be disappointed. Brianna Venosi reports. Let's start with the bad news. Despite efforts to minimize disruptions, commuters on nearly every New Jersey transit rail line should anticipate delays this summer. How much and how long will depend on where you're traveling. The head of the rail agency defended plans to reroute trains during New York Penn track repairs to a group of lawmakers this morning, with the Morris and Essex line bearing the brunt of the pain, diverting customers on Midtown direct lines to Hoboken, where they'll pick up ferries or the path. Today, we learned that'll add another 30 to 45 minutes to their commute. I want to understand the process uh, and the communication as to the decision to just select the Morris Essex line. Let me start with this. Was that 100% New Jersey Transit's doing? The answer is yes. So we looked at an option that tried to literally uh, spread the pain. We looked at an option where every single Midtown Direct would be canceled. To soften the blow, customers on that rail line will get a 50 to 63 percent fare reduction with cross-honoring of tickets. New Jersey Transit Director Steve Santoro says that idea was a collaboration with the governor's office. The summer repairs will close three of the station's 21 tracks for eight weeks from July 10th to September 1st. If there's a derailment uh, at that Penn Station, uh, similar to what we had before, uh, they're, 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 I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. There's going to be issues. During the peak morning rush, 7,400 Morris Essex riders will be diverted to Hoboken. To accommodate, extra bus service will run from South Orange, and the PATH plans to add lines for the increased riders. For their part, New Jersey Transit contends they're doing the best with a situation that was out of their hands. So it wasn't until all of these mishaps of the last couple of months of derailments and that you became aware of what was really going on there. That's correct. Both the Christie administration and New Jersey Transit have found a foil in Amtrak, pointing fingers at their lack of communication over the degradation of tracks. Is there information that you withhold from them? No, I, I, look, we, 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 in terms of the condition of the railroad, we, we were absolutely willing to share information regarding its current state. NJT understands our work program, which is the work we intend to do. Critical problems that have arisen here, and nobody came forth to raise a red flag to say anything about what was happening to this infrastructure. It's estimated the fare reductions and cross-honoring will cost roughly $15 million. New Jersey Transit says it plans to get the money from Amtrak. Amtrak says that's not in their budget. And if you were hoping for good news at the end of this report, there isn't any. Amtrak also announced repair plans on the LIRR slated for early 2018, and they're expected to cause major rush hour disruptions. In the newsroom, Brianna Venosi, NJTV News. Turning from commuter consternation to political contention, 
Republican Representative Leonard Lentz has felt the wrath of voters in town halls before, but at the one he held last night, his 44th, constituents aimed their anger at a different target. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron reports. People who have been to Leonard Lance's other town halls say this was the mildest. Still, it occasionally got raucous. The first question was about the Trump budget and why it cuts Pell Grants, food stamps, Medicaid, and Social Security disability. Regarding the budget document, I, 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 do, I do not support it. There are provisions. Lance laid out his problems with it. I think it's very important, for example, that there be uh, funds in the budget at least to begin the discussion on the Gateway Tunnel, which is important to New, New Jersey and New York. Um, it all comes down to what happens in the appropriations process, he said. And uh, we in New Jersey have, as chairman of the Appropriations Committee, the Congressman Freelingheisen, he is the only New Jersey... A Somerville man said he's a Republican but cannot stand Trump. I think the, uh, the clear criminality of the current administration and lack of outcry. He said the Republican Party is morally bankrupt. I cannot see myself voting for any Republican for any office for the foreseeable future. Instead of defending Trump, Lance said, leave it up to special counsel Robert Mueller. I uh, support the uh, special counsel, Mr. Mueller. I think that that is a, an excellent step. When will you call out the president and the Republican leadership on the tax returns that should have been released? I'm of the opinion that the president's tax returns are likely to be subpoenaed by the special counsel. He added, Bob Mueller will do a superb job and let the chips fall where they may. A watch young man said he writes to Lance every day about Trump. This administration is the most foul administration. Thank you. Your, your, your comments are similar to your emails. <laughs> Lance said he votes his conscience and he'll support Trump when he agrees with him. He took issue with the president on NATO. I certainly continue to believe that the NATO alliance is indispensable. Thank you. And he stood up for the Paris Accord on climate change. I hope that uh, the administration will not leave the Paris agreement. He's a lone voice, meaning I didn't come here to just berate him, but I really want him to have a spine, but he doesn't have a coalition in the GOP right now that has a spine. This was like the town halls you see on TV, a lot of anti-Trump sentiment boiling up. What's unclear is how representative this audience is of the general population. I think those who uh, come to my town hall meetings uh, uh, in large part tend to be disappointed with the election of, of President Trump. I can understand that from the perspective of, of some of my constituents. Two issues got standing ovations, Medicare for all and funding for Planned Parenthood. In Cranford, I'm Michael Aaron, NJTV News. Atlantic County freeholders vote to sue the state. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Northfield, where the issue is the agreement that allows casinos to make pilot payments, payments in lieu of taxes. The county counted on getting 13.5% share of the pilot money each year for 10 years, but this year it's getting just 10.4%, a loss of $4 million. The vote to spend up to half a million dollars on the suit had just one naysayer. Freeholder Ernest Corsi argued if pilot were to be thrown out, the casinos could keep appealing their assessments, diminishing the county take even more. County Council Jim Ferguson indicated the suit will allege the payment in lieu of taxes is unconstitutional. Next to Lower Alloways Creek Township, where the Salem 2 nuclear reactor is back in business. It was taken offline six weeks ago, so PSE&G Nuclear could perform more than $35 million worth of upgrades and repairs to equipment, including installing a reactor coolant pump, circulating water system, and main power transformers. 
And while they were at it, employees and a thousand outside contractors replaced a third of the reactor core's fuel assemblies and 129 of the baffle bolts that secure the metal liner inside the core, most of which were replaced proactively. Finally, Trenton, where it's halfway to Halloween. The Trenton Police Department's second annual community carnival is free for all with bouncy houses, obstacle courses, rock climbing walls, a mechanical bull, and a dunk tank. And the guy in the hot seat will be police director Ernest Parry, who's challenging kids to bring their best fastballs. Halfway to Halloween will be held Thursday, the only day with weather forecast to feel slightly warmer than it does on Halloween. And that's our Garden State Express for Wednesday, May 31st. Don't stay up in your neighborhood. Tip us off. State police have a new tool in tracking criminals using a faster, more efficient way to trace the life story of weapons used by criminals in the commission of a crime. Michael Hill got a close-up look. When police recover crime guns, bullets, or shell casings, they take them to one of seven labs for forensics processing, a drawn-out system that state police commanders recently cut from 10 months to 48 hours in their one-stop shop. They invited the media to a behind-the-scenes tour, starting with intake detectives. They glove up, they mask up. Um, basically, if a firearm comes in, what we do is we try to preserve that evidence. DNA evidence, fingerprints, saliva, sweat, blood. If there's any to be found, it will be discovered here, where weapons undergo a rigorous multi-step examination in the crime scene room, now under the same roof with the rest of the lab. It runs about a 25-minute cycle. Fingerprints are photographed right away for potential matching in a national database. We would put it down this chute right here. Another step, firing a gun into a closed ballistics water tank to retrieve the bullet. The water will keep the bullet pristine. Each gun leaves a specific impression on this fired ammunition. Information key to comparing the head stamp of the casing with others in the computerized National Integrated Ballistics Identification Network. It's looking for a twin in this demonstration. Now this is two different cartridge cases, but at this point we're looking at the same gun. Confirmation will come when a firearms examiner analyzes the potential match under a microscope, a match that could lead to solving other crimes inside and outside of New Jersey. While it seems impressive to go from 10 months all the way to 48 hours or less to process firearms, state police say what is most impressive about that is being able to prevent other crimes. Police say the magical time difference came when they focused more on gathering evidence for prevention to share with in-the-field detectives instead of just prosecution for a court case. If we can save a life, if we can stop a shooting, that's much more important than actually investigating a shooting or a homicide. You think you've saved lives because you can do it, uh, process weapons faster? Yes. The ATF is a major partner across the country. And what we are ultimately trying to do is use this technology to identify that very small population of, of, of criminals that are actually shooting, not just simply possessing the guns. New Jersey State Police and the rest of our law enforcement partners are doing everything in our power to bring justice to the victims, to bring offenders off the streets, and to keep the people of New Jersey safe. In Hamilton Township, Michael Hill, NJTV News. Standing by now with the state of New Jersey business is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda, big pharma's in the legal crosshairs. That's right, Mary Alice. The opioid crisis has prompted another lawsuit against five pharmaceutical companies, all of which have some operations in New Jersey. Ohio becomes the second state to file a lawsuit against the drug makers for their roles in the crisis. The companies named in the suit are Johnson & Johnson and its Janssen unit, Allergan, Teva Pharmaceuticals, Purdue Pharma, and Endo Health Solutions. Ohio's attorney general says the companies peddled prescription opioids to win over doctors, downplaying the risks. J&J &J said the allegations in the suit are legally and factually unfounded. Most of the other companies declined comment. 
How to pay for transportation infrastructure improvements has been a hot topic lately. And now one of President Trump's advisors threw his support behind raising the federal gas tax to help pay for those projects. Richard LaFranc told business channel CNBC he would back a tax hike, which is something Trump raised as an option in May. Meantime, U.S. Senators Booker and Menendez and 10 members of New Jersey's congressional delegation have sent a letter to U.S. Transportation Secretary Elaine Chao urging her to continue federal funding for the Gateway Project. That project, of course, would upgrade the Northeast Corridor rail lines, including building new Hudson River tunnels. Don't be surprised if you see even more retail store closings. Payless Shoe Source may close an additional 400 stores as part of its bankruptcy plan, and Michael Kors says it will close at least an additional 100 stores due to the ongoing slump in luxury product sales. On Wall Street, stocks close lower. The Dow is off 20. And those are our top business stories this evening. Newark's troubled public schools are winding up a year having finalized a new teacher's contract, having initiated critical upgrades to aging buildings, and having made inroads toward regaining control from the state for the first time in 22 years. Newark State appointed school superintendent Chris Cerf sat down with David Cruz. So I haven't seen you for a while. You look to have settled in into this latest job. Thanks. Uh, I, I really feel good about the work, good about uh, where the district is today, and good about the path we're on for future progress. It seems to me that the, the biggest thing is that the temperature has just been turned down considerably. I remember the last year of the, your predecessor, I mean, that was tumult the whole year long. I mean, was that part of your goal was to, to just kind of cool things out a little bit? Well, I, I, will, I will say this. Uh, I think your observation is correct. I think that uh, there is a real focus uh, in the city of Newark uh, from all quarters, from the mayor's office, from the city council's perspective, from the elected school board's perspective, and from Newark Public Schools to keep an eye on what matters, and that is making sure that every child gets equitable access to a quality public education. Was part of your job here, uh, to the extent that you were given marching orders or not, uh, was part of it to uh, not only turn down the temperature, but also to maybe rebrand re and implement what was called One Newark then? Was that part of the mission? Well, there were no, there were no uh, marching orders, but I will say this, that uh, I have always operated on the view that uh, so long as people are focused on finding the right policies that uh, advance student learning, um, uh, then we can have disagreements about what those policies are, but we can't have disagreements about what the basic underlying facts are. So one of the things I've tried to do is to get us to collectively focus on what the objective facts are. And the objective facts are, I think, pretty simple, is that um, the schools are um, performing better. Um, the graduation rate has been up every year for many years now, and as uh, at about 74 uh, percent today. Math scores are up, reading scores are up, and part of this is because of the work, uh, whatever label you want to put on it, and it's featured by several things. One, we just entered into a new collective bargaining agreement that renewed the really sort of nation-leading collecting bargaining agreement of, uh, of 2012, which really puts a focus on effectiveness and quality and teacher development. Uh, we have uh, really focused on high standards and high expectations for all children. And we've really empowered parents with the opportunity to figure out what is the right school for their child's needs. And I think all of those have made a difference. So is that one Newark essentially rebranded as Newark Enrolls? I mean, there's some tweaks to that system, but it's a universal enrollment system still, yeah? You know, it's interesting that you ask the question that way. I would respectfully say it a little bit differently than that, which is that uh, Newark Enrolls is simply a centralized enrollment system. Right. It means that uh, when you uh, are an entering kindergartner, for example, and there are more people who want to go to a particular school than there are seats in that school. What are sort of neutral, equitable rules to decide who to prioritize? Do you prioritize whether you already have a sibling in the school? Do you prioritize whether you live in the neighborhood? Right, but isn't that part of what and One Newark was, a, one a Newark, system for that? Yeah, One Newark uh, 
I, I wasn't president at the creation, but one Newark essentially said, look, we are going to be indifferent to how a school comes into being, whether it's a traditional school, we just care that it is a great school. And we also uh, were focusing on uh, empowering parents with choice. Unfortunately, that name um, yeah. sort of got co-opted in the sort of high decibel political discussion, but Newark and Rolls is not one Newark. It's a very different thing. It's a component of it. All right. Uh, so I have very few seconds, maybe 30. Uh, tell me about local control, where you are, and when this is going to happen. We're making great progress. I am committed to it. The board is committed to it. Uh, everybody is committed to it. Uh, we just had our state review last week. Uh, it went very well. Uh, we anticipate getting our scores back. It's a metric-based uh, system. Uh, I anticipate that will be successful and the process will move forward. It involves a state board vote. The ultimate process, I, I would hope that the state board will vote for full control in the fall. It will then require the development of a transition plan, and when that is completed, the process will be complete. A year or two. Oh, it's less than that. Yeah. I, I would be very surprised if it, if it went uh, much past the beginning of the new year. All right, Christopher Surf, thanks for coming in. Thanks so much, my pleasure. Support for the Environment Report provided by PSE&G, making things more sustainable for New Jersey. Against a hard deadline, there's a multi-state water fight brewing over how much Delaware River water New York must release into the riverbed to keep afloat New Jersey's fishing and recre recreational facilities downstream. Brenda Flanagan reports. I think the river is being used as a political football, and uh, this is one of America's most important rivers. Jeff Skeldings with Friends of the Upper Delaware River. He says New Jersey and New York City officials are making waves over how to divvy up the river water after the current agreement expires at midnight. They're fighting like children in a sandbox. If you want to protect a river, the last thing you want to do is fight over the water. Skelding's worried about an upstream trout fishery that needs lots of cold, clean water. With five reservoirs upstream, New York physically controls water release downriver, and a flexible flow management program amongst four states and New York City has directed how it's shared. Under normal conditions, Jersey says it withdraws 65 million gallons of water a day at Lambertville to feed reservoirs like Round Valley that provide drinking water for about one and a half million people in central Jersey. But New Jersey officials want 100 million gallons a day guaranteed, even during drought conditions. We're trying to compromise on that number, but really the spirit of this is to try to, um, to benefit the state of New Jersey by having access to additional water that we have rights to. And we've shown um, time and time again we can allocate upwards of 100 million gallons a day and not risk New York City's water supplies. Jersey officials claim that New York City, which depends on the reservoirs for about 90 percent of its drinking water, fudges the numbers to short Jersey. We're not saying no to New Jersey. What we're saying is, you know, that their, that meeting their desires and their needs needs to be part of a uh, trying to address everyone's needs. In terms of laws and agreements, there's only one absolute, and that's a 1954 U.S. Supreme Court ruling. It says that the flow rate in the Delaware can't go below 1,750 cubic feet per second. That's at the point where the river enters New Jersey. Tubing, kayaking, and canoeing liveries need a reliable river. They got to start thinking about the small businesses. That's their livelihood. Yeah. I mean, and you know, I think we're, I think we're being pinched enough by government. John Ringoff owns the Choo Choo Grill in Phillipsburg. They share retail space with Twin River Tubing and depend on them to keep customers flowing. Once the summer starts kicking up, they bring in a lot of uh, people and it generates a lot of revenue for the Choo Choo Grill. New York State, New York City, Pennsylvania and Delaware have allegedly agreed to extend the flow program for another year. Negotiations continued all afternoon. It's, if I don't get what I want, you're not going to get what you want. That's what this whole debate has boiled down to. Would kayakers and hikers and, you know, families, this is a good recreational area, so it means a lot to so many people. Residents and advocates hope Jersey can find a compromise that floats everyone's boat. 
In Clinton Township, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. Tomorrow on NJTV News, eradicating standing pools where the Zika virus can breed. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thanks. See you tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Hi, I'm Ralph LaRosa. Oh, and Elmo's Elmo. And we're here to remind you how important it is for your family to have an emergency kit. That's right, just in case. I'm thinking about what to put in my family's emergency kit. Want to help me think? Okay. An emergency kit should have a flashlight and extra batteries. Oh, flashlight? Oh, batteries? And <laughs> lots of water and canned food. Oh, okay. Water? Oh, canned food? Wow, Elmo, you really are a good thinker. Thank you, Mr. Ralph. <laughs> Download Sesame Street's free Let's Get Ready app at your favorite app store today. Insurance is a complicated subject. Add a language barrier and it's just a disaster. My name is Melissa Estevez and I work for Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey at Horizon Connect. I love my job because I'm able to connect with the people. Once they realize they can come here and speak to someone in Spanish, they keep coming. Health insurance is very complicated, especially today. I love making it simple for people. It's something that makes me feel fulfilled.